Okay, great. Then let me share my screen. Give me just a moment. Okay, is everyone able to see that? Okay. Yes. Um, so this was the agenda is just um, recap of the plan, summary of key changes, what's happening next, um, time for Q&A, and then uh, following up the, the second meeting. Um, and also, I would invite you for some, you know, for some reason, we have a smaller group than actually registered. Uh, I would encourage you to reach out to any of your companions who you think might be interested um, as we talk about the zoning next time. Um, so very brief recap. This has been going for some time. We started it in 2015. Um, we did a relaunch in 2017 and 2018 and brought on our racial equity consultants. Um, we uh, took both to help us with our racial equity policy and to help with our community engagement. Um, 2018 through 2019, uh, we created several drafts of the plan, um, got public review of them, did a racial equity impact assessment of an initial version of the report that we've carried those recommendations through. Um, and then for the last few years, uh, since the release of the the public review draft plan. Um, we've been working on finalizing the plan and then developing the zoning. That is the very first step toward implementing the plan. Um, and now we are in the phase of, we've released the final draft plan that was released, released on March 22nd, um, both the full plan. And then we also released a um, sort of an abridged uh, DOS handbook version of it that we thought would be easier than the 500 page version um, for people who kind of wanted to get a, a good sense of what was in the, what the policies were and what the goals were without reading absolutely every detail. Um, and we're working on um, any day now, we should have versions of those in Chinese and Spanish as well. Um, and then we're going to be uh, taking the final draft, um, the plan, the zoning, the general plan am amendments and the final EIR uh, for adoption and certification. Um, these are just some of the images of some of the community engagement that's happened um, over these years. Um, everything from youth summit and huge workshops to one-on-one -on -one interviews and um, showing up at pop-up community events. Um, but really wanted to focus on what's been happening since the plan. Um, so during the 2019 public review, um, there were a number of public meetings, um, pop-ups at community events. We held, um, we did gave presentations on the public review draft at, uh, across a number of different city boards and commissions, cultural affairs, landmarks board, parks, bicycle and pedestrian board, commission on aging, um, mayor's commission, persons with disabilities, sort of whole range, including ZUC and, and planning commission. Um, we also had held uh, community advisory group meetings reviewing the, the comments on the preliminary draft, which was published earlier in 2019, looked at implementation, talked about how feedback was incorporated, um, and then talked about the initial feasibility study for the zoning incentive program. Um, then from 2020 to 2021, um, we started revising the plan based on the comments we had received um, and revising the environmental impact report as well. Uh, under CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, and we did a bunch more uh, economic analysis of the zoning incentive program. So not just looking at the feasibility of the program, but trying to understand um, what kind of value would be created by the, um, through the zoning incentive program by the incentives we we're offering, and then what the um, cost of community benefits would be so that we could understand how to price those. Um, we held CAG meetings on community benefits, on the structure of, of the program, and then another one on housing and implementation strategies. Um, then in 2021, 2023, we worked on really actually drafting the planning code amendments and changes to the zoning map. Um, we published those in 2022. We did three focused community meetings on various topics, the special districts, the new, um, uh, the land uses, the new zones. 
um, and the zoning incentive program. Um, did an online survey, had a bunch of targeted meetings, including with the Black Arts Movement and Business District, uh, Chinatown stakeholders, and Jack London stakeholders around Third Street, um, uh, particularly because we're looking at, um, uh, we have an entirely new section on, on Victory Court. That's one of the appendices to the plan. Um, we had meetings of the Landmarks Board that was extended to two meetings. We had a meeting of the Zoning Update Committee, which was extended and became three meetings. Um, and we had three CAG meetings, one on zoning, one on policy objectives, and one was an affordable housing and zoning incentive program study session, because there were a lot of questions about how the zoning incentive program uh, interacted with our affordable housing goals and the state density bonus. Um, so now in 2024, we are on the, the revisions of the zoning. Um, we have wrapped up wrapped those up in response to the comments that we heard. Um, we did already have uh, a follow-up ZUC meeting um, after all of the zoning incentive program additional work had been done. That was um, into 2023. But now we're going to be going back to the Landmarks Board as they had requested um, with the changes to the zoning. And we're going to be, after that, we're going to be going to Planning Commission and we're going to have, um, similar to what we're doing with this CAG meeting, we're going to have two meetings of the Planning Commission. The first one is also going to be on the plan and the second one is also going to be on the zoning and the EIR. Um, and then, yeah, we're doing that with the, with the CAG meetings. Um, hopefully the Planning Commission will recommend moving it forward to City Council, um, to the Community and Economic Development Committee. And we are hoping um, that if everybody is happy with the plan, um, that we'll be able to do that and have it adopted by the summer recess for City Council. Um, so that's what we've been working on. That's, uh, that's the plan moving forward. Um, just a fairly brief recap of the plan itself. Um, the goal behind the downtown specific plan is to modernize and broaden the role of downtown, particularly coming out of the pandemic. We understand how important it is to have a mixed use downtown um, that serves a lot of different goals, isn't just focused on office jobs, but has entertainment and housing and um, even uh, R&D jobs where appropriate. Um, also industrial jobs in the port area of the downtown, um, increasing housing and jobs near transit by streamlining housing development and providing community benefits in return for, um, in return for additional density, uh, expanding funding for public services through both the much smaller one-time development impact fees and also the zoning incentive program fees um, if someone takes advantage of the, that optional program, um, but also the much more significant tax revenues that we get long-term from development. Uh, uh, the goal is to revitalize local businesses and enhance public safety by bringing more people into the downtown and making sure that businesses are able to afford and stay in the downtown um, and that we have the infrastructure in place to help uh, enliven the downtown and the public realm that really supports cultural activity in the streets. Um, to prepare for climate change and sea level rise by both requiring um, comprehensive adaptation plans for any new development proposed in sea level rise areas, but also to work regionally on um, adapting to sea level rise and also trying to prevent future additional climate change. Um, and then finally to reconnect West Oakland with downtown um, working, you know, we've already set the, set the table for the uh, study that Caltrans is doing on Vision 980 to think about how we can re-envision I-980. Um, but to do it very thoughtfully in a way that repairs harm that was done to the black community by uh, rooting that through West Oakland. Um, the plan goals uh, and vision, um, equity is, uh, is something that connects all of these. It's not its own standalone chapter. Um, and the goals are uh, in the areas of economic opportunity, housing and homelessness, uh, mobility, culture keeping, community health and sustainability, and land use. Um, and then we also have these each have their own chapter. Um, and then the last chapter is on implementation and engagement. So making sure that the plan actually gets implemented and making sure that we're partnering, partnering with the community to make that uh, implementation happen. Um, 
some of the ways that the plan achieves these goals are by setting policy, uh, setting a work plan for many city departments, um, again, to do in partnership with the community, um, and monitoring outcomes to make sure that we're getting what we want out of the policy. Um, it incorporates a racial equity framework and measures of success, many of which relate to racial equity and racial disparities. Um, we concurrently will ad adopt general plan and zoning changes that will help implement the plan, and it will certify the environmental impact report, which will allow any development that meets the goals of the downtown specific plan to proceed um, without uh, additional environmental review required. Um, and then last, um, just on implementation, um, it contains an implementation matrix, which includes short to long-term implementation actions. Um, the city is the lead on many, but not all of those. Some of those are partner agencies and all, pretty much all of them, most of them at least, will require um, involvement from the community. Um, the, uh, the concurrent adoption of the zoning map and planning code amendments will help with the implementation. Um, racial equity impact assessment will be conducted on all of the new implementation programs. That's really become citywide policy, um, but we've also built it into the downtown specific plan that that needs to happen as we're implementing. Um, and then uh, the plan is for an ongoing specific plan implementation steering committee that would help the, help advise the city, um, but would also help do work to develop pro partnerships and programs. Um, so it's not all on the city, it's, it's done in partnership with the community. So that's an overview of the plan itself. Um, and now let's talk about um, what has changed from the public review draft in 20, late 2019 to the final draft plan that was released in March of this year. So the first thing I wanna start with is what is new. Um, what's new is two different appendices. Um, we have one appendix that relates to Victory Court and one appendix that relates to the Green Loop. Um, these aren't new concepts. These were already discussed uh, quite a bit in the, in the draft plan, um, but we wanted something that was much more concrete uh, to have in the plan that could, as these areas are being developed, um, would provide more specific guidance instead of more conceptual. Um, so the Victory Court area is this Eastern Jack London area that's right by the Lake Merritt Channel. It's, um, it's kind of a bridge between the development that's happening at Brooklyn Basin and the rest of downtown and the Lake Merritt Station area plan. This image is just a potential rendering of what could go there for the purpose of understanding potential development. Um, so what is estimated looking at these buildings is um, around 6,000 uh, new units, new housing units, um, but also commercial space, both a combination of office or as we're seeing the shifts in office, um, that might not be office, that might be other forms of jobs. It might be um, R&D, which actually, you know, doesn't have the kind of industrial impacts that it did in the past, but that still has a high density of jobs um, and is much more in person than office. Um, and then retail and neighborhood serving commercial. Um, and the appendix includes just a description of what would need to happen in order to make this victory court mixed use neighborhood um, actually happen into the future. So some of that would be um, dependent on the city moving their fire training facility, which is in the works um, to another part of the city uh, that's in the Victory Court area. Um, it would require extending Third Street through the new development area, um, which it, it once went through and it was abandoned, but we would put this in place so that if the um, owner of the property here wanted to redevelop, uh, they would need to allocate um, right of way to, to reconnecting. Um, it would involve creating new multi-use paths to connect people in the development area to the Lake Merritt Channel, so along here, um, and to Estuary Park crossings here. Um, and it would also require a, a 60 foot wide landscape buffer between any new development and the Lake Merritt Channel. The idea is that ultimately um, there would be connections and we've, we've removed the, um, the 
clearly not feasible pedestrian bridge uh, that had once been envisioned, but we're looking at other forms of connection, including potentially crossing over the um, abandoned railroad bridge or building a new one at some point in the future. But this is really trying to set the stage for some additional uh, details for how the victory court um, Lorna, doesn't goes. doesn't BCDC yes. require a hundred foot separation from the channel? Um, I I'm not sure about that. I know they require a hundred feet. I let me check on that and get back to you, unless somebody else in the room knows the answer to that. I also thought it was a hundred feet. Yeah, we'll check on that. Thank you. Was that? Did I see that in the chat? Oh no, I actually, Tiffany arrived. Hi, Tiffany. Tiffany Eng has also joined us. Um, and then the other appendix that we've added to the specific plan is the green loop. Um, so the intent of the green loop is to, uh, it, it's, it's a loop, but it's also a set of connections and gateways to the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, the idea is to be able to walk and bicycle in a, sort of an, a much higher level of um, pedestrian amenities, bicycle amenities, landscaping, um, public art uh, than, than some of the other streets um, because it really connects some of our great features like our water, um, the estuary waterfront, the lake. Uh, some of our parks, it connects to the West Oakland Walk, which connects to a lot more um, schools and parks and historic resources. Um, and this, uh, this appendix um, uh, describes um, a number of different ways to do that. It, it provides some guidelines uh, for the streets, um, but then it's also combined with uh, with some zoning tools that we'll talk about more when we have the zoning meeting. Um, it involves combining zones and open space zones and, and cre creates additional requirements for any development that happens along the, the green loop for landscaping and, and more friendly, pedestrian friendly frontages. Um, in terms of what has changed, um, we, because the COVID pandemic uh, came came through just after we had reviewed this. We spent a long time really looking at the policies and checking to make sure that they were still um, relevant and seeing if there was anything that we needed to change. Um, generally, what we took away is that the pandemic, once we started coming out of it and getting a better sense of what had changed, um, was that a lot of the policies that we were already looking at in the plan, um, were still necessary and were much more necessary um, because a lot of the, the problems that we were trying to solve were only exacerbated by the pandemic, um, including the fact that, um, including racial inequities, including um, housing crisis, including uh, commercial vacancies that were already happening as, um, as the switch away from in-person retail to online retail was happening. Um, as people were already starting to work hybrid and remote jobs. Um, so really it's, it's the, the plan um, made some changes, but really doubled down on how do we make a mixed, um, a mixed use downtown that really is available for everybody, not just sort of a financial district. Um, and as part of that, um, making sure that we're maintaining a whole range of jobs, not just office jobs, um, we created a, a, a slightly revised vision for downtown. Um, mostly we just did a little bit of wordsmithing on the, on the vision. And like I said, I'll give this out to everyone and you can read just sort of the difference yourself. Um, but what you'll see in the difference here is actually most significant over by Howard Terminal. There's a, a difference um, in the, the development and actually it'll show a little bit more on this slide um, where we show side by side where the public review draft plan had focused a bit more on um, having mixed use development over by Howard Terminal. That's also when the A's stadium was being looked at um, and, uh, and we got a lot of feedback also the A stadium did not happen um, or has not happened. Um, 
uh, but we also got a lot of feedback that we needed to protect that port area because there are a lot of um, industrial jobs that are really important uh, that uh, that pay you know very well. Our union jobs don't require um, a huge amount of education, and so they're really important jobs for our community. Um, and so we shifted the the development program. Um, so you can see on the right side, there's no longer that tall, more intense development there. Um, but we still wanted to make sure that we maintained the same amount of um, housing units. That was really critical. And so you'll see that on the right, things changed a little bit as well um, to accommodate for keeping the same amount of housing, uh, housing units, just um, uh, maintaining them in different parts of the, the downtown. And you can see the development program here. Um, just describes the, the actual um, square footage results of that. Um, there are some additional changes to the bicycle network map. Some of it was just um, catching up with the most recent version of the bicycle plan. Um, we also tried to be a little bit more clear that um, that the vision network, there are still priority pr projects of the vision network. It's not just like someday we hope visionary things will happen. Um, so we tried to be a little bit more nuanced with that and there are some changes. Um, we also shifted the sea level rise map in here um, to be more consistent with, with what we have changed citywide, um, looking not only at uh, 48 inches and 72 inches of sea level rise, but also looking at 108 inches of sea level rise as it's become more evident that we need to be doing that. Um, and so those have been factored into the sea level rise zoning um, combining area as well. Um, and then we also added um, to the area around the courthouse by the lake um, there, there's a, just a new illustrated vision for the public realm there. I would, uh, like, I would like to make a comment. Don't, yeah. don't build another pier out into the lake. This is an absolutely wrong idea here and it needs to not happen. Reason if you want to. Can, would you mind just saying a little bit more uh, about? First of all, we have multiple piers sticking out into the lake, which the city is unable to maintain. There's one blocked off at the other uh, Glen Echo Creek. You are asking uh, for all these wonderful visions, but there is no maintenance. And so you are building in future blight. Okay. Second, yep. there was earlier a plan to put some kind of a water walking out in the water ramp here in the Lake Merritt master plan and it was decided not to do that. It seems to me like this means somebody didn't look at that old situation. Um, but this is one of the places where there is some natural edge to the lake, a dirt edge, and you will have an environmental impact on wildlife, not to mention the colors. So there, there are many reasons why this is a terrible idea. It's a terrible idea. Don't do it. Okay. What is actually being proposed, Joanna? It, it's, it looks like a, a mistake on the plan. Um, do you mean the... the yeah, that, that crisscross series of... Yeah, that, that is an extremely uh, conceptual idea. We're not actually... We don't have actual plans in here, like uh, the appendix uh, appendices that we do for the Green Loop or the other one. This would obviously involve um, a lot more um design review from the public and from dot it's i think the the main focus here is just on um improving the public realm around this intersection in particular um and in tandem with the um with the county building because right now it's a pretty unpleasant place for humans to walk um so the idea is just really focusing on new street improvements, um, building out the plaza there. And then it also shows, you know, the potential jazz museum, which we'll see, you know, in what form that actually takes. Um, this is, so it's, this is all a very conceptual drawing, but it's really just trying to focus on um, public improvements around this area. Yeah, the, the Lake Merritt Boulevard plan and the Measure DD coalition, uh, as Naomi says, uh, did, uh, vote quite strongly to take out uh, uh, an, a pier that had been 
proposed in an early plan. So uh, we don't really see the the necessity or that that re trying to reconfigure that that uh, that intersection is a good idea. A lot of improvements have been made with pedestrian walkways, so you can now get across the different ways. But we don't see that this would be an improvement. Uh, I would thank you for that history. Ask whether yeah. an additional pier is covered in your environmental impact report. And I would just suggest that you lop it off before you get to the lake path. Just lop that thing off. Don't include it. Okay. I think we can probably consider that. Thank you for that that input. Um, I just have a couple more slides on the um, on some of the changes, um, and I'm just going to go through them fairly quickly because they're it's like detailed um, maps that I think you'll probably just want to take a look at yourself. Um, so one of them is the character area map. Um, unfortunately, a lot some of what has changed here is that the color um, palette has changed, but I think the important thing is is somewhat we just, we changed um, from this like mixed use downtown core, mixed use pedestrian corridor um, to kind of a more streamlined set of uses. Um, I would take a look at it and we're happy to sort of talk through it with you um, if you have questions about it. But this is sort of the character area map. It doesn't have the kind of policy that the other ones do. Um, the next one is the general plan amendments map. Um, and that's going to be, uh, we're actually going to be releasing that as part of the package with the zoning tomorrow. Um, so you can, that'll come with the actual text changes. So that'll make a little bit more sense when you look at those. Um, and then the intensity map also. Um, hopefully you all got the uh, the version that we sent out that had the, the labels on it. Um, we sent out in our email today. So I know you all had requested a version that was easier to read by having labels. So we did, uh, we sent out the existing and the proposed intensity map with the labels. Um, and then what this is, is the proposed intensity map as it is changed from 2019 to now. Um, and that includes there are also this also shows changes to the zoning incentive program boundary, um, and we tried to make it easier to read um, both by <laughs> making the uh, the two keys consistent. And then this one shows on the the right hand side, um, it, it's colored in where they changed. So consistent with what I was showing about how um, you know we had. Uh, we had taller buildings along Howard Terminal and all the way down um, toward, I guess, like Castro and Brush um, along the freeway here. Uh, while this was lower density, we've pulled that all back here and created more of an industrial transition zone. Um, that's one of the major changes. Um, we've had some intensity changes, not super major, but um, in the Victory Court area, um, I think we, on the edge of old Oakland there, I think we might've pulled some things up, but on the edge of old Oakland and then over in this area, just across the freeway. So you can, if you wanna get into the details of it, again, I'll share this with everybody. Um, and Sorry. Take a look in. Yeah. Is the gray in there? The gray means it's unchanged from yes. the previous, the unchanged left side, or the yeah? What was what's Correct. the gray like? Where? Yeah. So okay. it means that it's unchanged from the 2019 version. Okay. Thanks. Um, and then the last thing is just the next steps. So we published the final draft plan on March 22nd. We are planning to publish the final draft zoning amendments. Um, tomorrow. Uh, the plan is to publish the environmental impact report on April 26th. Um, and we are going to the landmarks board on May 6th. Um, the new date for the second CAG meeting will be May 9th. 
Um, and then planning commission dates will be uh, May 15th and June 6th. Um, and we're anticipating June and July for CED and council. So I will stop sharing there. Um, I see some in the chat. Oh, okay, Stephanie. Um, Stephanie posted the links to those revised maps. Um, so um, I guess I can stop. Well, I can keep the recording going. Uh, would you prefer I stop the recording or keep the recording going for the comment period? I think just keep it going. Okay. Just that's me to do that. Yeah. Um, so I know that was a lot, but I think that uh, the plan itself, um, particularly in tandem with this, which is something that we'll also include in the, the staff report for planning commission so they can see some of the changes, um, help to understand the, the main changes. So any questions about the plan? Can, um, can we submit comments? Yeah. Okay. Um... Um, I mean, I would say when you're asking who does it, my recommendation would be that if you have comments that you want to submit that relate to um, landmarks, that you submit them to the Landmarks Preservation Advisory Board and, you know, the other comments, find a submit to us, or you can submit them to Planning Commission as we're getting ready for the Planning Commission meeting. But yes, absolutely, you can submit oh, comments. I have some questions and comments now, but I see Tiffany and James had their hands up and now um, Jeff go ahead, Chris. You you spoke first, so I think you should take it. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. All right, thank you. Um, first is a question, uh, and it concerns the zip and the state density bonus law. Uh, as I some of you know, the S13 zone that was adopted as part of the housing element zoning amendments, um, you know, has is set up so that if you are doing certain types of affordable housing in the S13 zone you get increased density, unlimited density, if I recall correctly, and height increases, I believe it's up to two stories. Uh, but if you take advantage of those incentives for uh, affordable housing, you're not eligible for the state density bonus law. It's one or the other. Uh, the way the ZIP is set up, at least for residential projects, the ZIP increased intensities you get under the ZIP uh, serves a base density for the state density bonus law. And and Oakland Heritage Alliance, at least preliminarily, feels that's inappropriate. The base densities are already too high in many areas. And if they're with the zip, it's even higher. State density bonus law on top of that just drives it all through the roof. And we don't see this as a really coherent strategy to get the level of affordable housing that is needed. At the same time, it incentivizes what we sometimes call a slumlord mentality regarding existing buildings where there's this potential for extreme new development. And that's an incentive for owners to not take care of their buildings or to engage long-term leases for their tenants. So we've said this repeatedly or words to this effect. And so I apologize for repeating myself and that we've had, and we very much appreciate the discussions that staff has had on these issues. We were hoping that there would be some scaling back of the proposed densities. But my main question is uh, why for the zip, the that would serve as a base intensity for density bonus projects, just with regard now to residential, there's the other community benefits. That's a, you know, that's a corollary discussion, but my okay. question, I can respond to that. So first, just to clear to clarify what the differences between the two programs. So the S13, what that allows of the affordable housing um, uh, overlay zone is essentially that if a developer wants to take advantage of that, that they can actually go two stories taller than what the existing zone allows and unlimited density. So they can fit as much density that, as is possible within that additional two stories. So one, it doesn't really work to have a density bonus on something where you're already given to a certain extent unlimited density. 
And in that instance, we also, so that's why it's an either or situation. Um, and in, in that instance, you know, we're really trying to, uh, as, you know, essentially for 100% affordable housing projects, be able to get as much as, as possible within a certain building envelope. Um, and given certainty, you know, also to the community of what that, you know, additional height may be. But again, there is an unlimited density within that height allowance. So it's a very different uh, process. And what originally, if you all recall, when we started the downtown specific plan, the idea was to allow additional density in downtown. That was the purpose of, this, of the plan. Look at where we can have additional density near transit. Um, this is an area, you know, with our ECAP that we say we want to prioritize, to, you know, density and development. You're near BART, you're near lots of bus lines, um, ferry, you know, there's, it's, it's the hub of the city. We want to have, um, from an environmental, environmental standpoint, a lot of density in this area. And so the original we were looking at from our um, development, pro you know, um, uh, program, what we wanted as maximum allow, or you know, to have this additional density, and that was what we started in our EIR was that density as well. So the intent all along was to have that as really our base density. That was the intent, um, and because we did hear from the community that we didn't want, you know, they didn't want us to give that additional density away without some kind of um, community benefits in return. So that is what we've done. We've created a program with community benefits, but it's to basically get to what we originally had wanted as a base uh, density, a base height and so forth. And so that is why we are allowing the state density bonus on top of that, um, because essentially that really is becoming the new base at that point once the developer does that. And then at that point, in order to get the state density bonus, they would actually you know, have to provide the amount of affordable housing units, so whether that's 10% for you know moderate or or 50, but depending on what kind of concessions and waivers they want. And, and at that point, they'll, you'll actually get more affordable units because your base number of units is going to be um, larger than it would have been otherwise um, without the extra density allowed in that area. So that is you know the essentially the rationale behind what we have done. Can I respond to, Laura, thank you. Um, your first point about the comparison of the S13 approach being different than the ZIP approach, you indicated that with the S13, that because unlimited density is allowed within two stories, it's not really comparable to the ZIP. However, you know, my understanding of how the state density bonus law works if you have unlimited base density is that you take a look at the building envelope that can be created by the uh, by the zoning standards so if it's a six-story height limit uh including with a um well it's a six-story height limit setbacks and so forth you take a look at the total square footage that can be allowed then and then the number of units that are proposed under the base zoning you use that as a starting point and then you apply whatever percentage of increase you get depending on the type of affordable housing you're using to that base square footage base building size base height and base number of units keeping in keeping the same unit mix that you have in terms of square footage number of bedrooms and so forth uh as part of your bonus project. Um, I'm, I, I hope that's clear. I, I may not be able to explain that as clearly as I would have liked. And I think probably Jeff might have something to say about this as well. And, and Laura, you uh, and other staff may uh, have something as well. Um, that, that's that's a, a clarification on, on your first point. Uh, with your other points, uh, I won't go into detail, but I'll just reiterate that the base densities are already too high in many areas, particularly historic areas. We, we were asking that they be kept out of the APIs and ASIs. If you have these base densities that high, it eliminates a lot of the incentive to get the TDRs. The plan even admits this, that the densities are so high, it's unlikely the TDRs will be viable on many sites. And the base densities in many cases are too high to even incentivize the zip. But uh, 
but particularly my my first point about the comparison of the S13 and the ZIP. Uh, am I off base in the understanding I stated regarding how the date density bonus law works when you have unlimited base density? I'm, I mean, I, I don't know, we have to, I didn't know if I totally understood what you stated, but I will will say that our S13 overlay zone um, also a lot has reduced side yard setbacks. Uh, we actually we actually kind of built in some of the concessions already in that program, and it's really trying to, and and we worked actually Jeff worked on that with us. We worked with EBHO and other affordable housing developers to really try to make it as simple and straightforward so that they know what they will get essentially if they propose a project in that. So they already, instead of trying to ask for some concessions and waivers or things that, you know, maybe you, you do get or don't get, or you don't have to do go through that process that, you know, if, if you propose a project here, this is what you can get. And so it was meant to be a very, I think, streamlined process because it's also a by right process as well. So it, it's it's different. Is all it's it's not the same as what we're proposing for the the zoning incentive program, and so it's, they're they're set up differently because of that. But there are similarities, and our basic recommendation here is to structure the zip the same way as the S thirteen zone. That if you're using the zip, you don't get the the density bonus, and make sure you structure the zip so that you will get more affordable housing than you would if you use the s if you use the if you use the state density bonus program maybe if jeffrey has some comments he should probably i'd like to hear from uh, the rest join of in on this yeah Jeff, do you have comments that you would like to um, well i'll i'll wait my turn and i'm assuming that some of this we're going to get into at the next meeting when we get into the zoning as well i have right. Yeah. some non-zoning related questions, but let's hear from James and Tiffany first. Yeah, go ahead, James. Uh, sorry, I'm not quite sure whose hand went up first. James, James mine's not okay. housing related. Yeah. Okay, yeah, go ahead, James. Okay, I'll, I'll make some general comments here and maybe if there's time, I'll do others, more detailed ones or submit those in writing. Uh, let me start with something that's uh, very seemingly unimportant, but uh, at the top of page 37, where Bobby Seal is uh, discussed, uh, be sure and spell the seal correctly. S e a l e. Did it? It missed a letter. Okay, okay. we'll fix that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one of the things that come uh, uh, requested in the early uh, drafts of the plan was that uh, race and equity should not be a separate standalone chapter but should be integrated into all the chapters. And I see that you have done that. So very, very glad you've done that. However, I wasn't always clear that in each of the chapters, there is a specific uh, uh, calling out uh, race and equity and what the uh, objectives are and, and that there are some you know, metrics are, are uh, expected measures for achievement or accomplishment. Uh, as I read through the chapters, I did very quickly. I wasn't sure that in all the chapters there was that kind of attention to to race and equity within within that specific chapter. Also, just in terms of organization, it looks like it takes about four pages just to name the chapter chapter zero one, and then there are about other pages before you actually get to the discussion. There's about three or four more pages that essentially just say, this is chapter zero one. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, uh, not reading that correctly, but anyway, that was uh, one of the. Okay. The uh, Also, the, the plan does discuss adjusting impact fees as a way to, uh, I don't know, to deliver uh, uh, revenue, whatever. But uh, one of the things, and also affordable housing, but since this is such a forward-looking plan, shouldn't inclusionary housing be mentioned in some way uh, as a future goal or something? Because 
so many jurisdictions do, uh, in fact, many of them feature inclusionary housing over impact fees, but uh, some do both. But it seems to me that in, in a forward-looking plan, we ought to, ought to mention impact fees in some way. Uh, and relative to uh, homelessness and, and, and treating the, the effects of, of homelessness, uh, we really have to talk about decommodifying housing and how we can do that. As long as it's in the, it's in the, uh, the speculative market, and with Costa Hawking still raging, I don't know why that's even still in the state law, but as long as it's there, there are always going to be humongous increases in the in the cost of rent. And cost of rent will spoil everything that the plan hopes to do in terms of of uh, assisting small small businesses, nonprofit developers. Uh, you know, culture keeping and and all of those kinds of uses will be driven continually driven out unless uh, uh, one of the suggestions we have is that perhaps there ought to be some attention to developing city-owned hubs or or major buildings, which can be taken out of the speculative market, and then uh, you know there can be uh, little malls or, or concentrations of uses that, that really need lower, lower rent uh, that can be concentrated. And uh, that, but, but we have to decommodify some uses in order for these, these, these types of developments to survive. So I'll stop there and let others chime in. Thank you. Thank you. That was a, a good selection of comments. Um, one thing I just wanted to respond to um, was um, on the the specific calling out of race and equity and metrics in the chapters. Um, we do have a uh, a section near the beginning of the plan in the vision that describes um, the policies that we think address race and equity, um, and they are they sort of cross-reference the various chapters. So there are policies in every chapter, um, but it sounds like that's not clear enough. So maybe we need to do some sort of standalone handout or something that sort of describes where those are in there. So at, look, at least look at it because that's a very important part of the plan and it, it ought to be, I mean, in some way it needs to stand out, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. thank you for that. And then um, um, on, the I'll take a look at the the four pages to get to a chapter thing and see what's going on there. Um, Laura, do you want to say anything about the inclusionary housing and the? Yeah, I did put a response in the chat, but oh. um, yeah. So basically, I just want to highlight for the the housing element, which is essentially covering the whole city as opposed to just the downtown. Um, we do have in there looking at evaluating our impact fees, as well as the in looking at inclusionary zoning. So that is something that we are looking at as part of, and it has, and the housing element is sort of yeah, it's over the whole city as opposed to the downtown plan is just looking over only at the downtown. Okay. Thanks. Um, and then absolutely hear you on decommodifying housing. I think, you know, what we're sort of trying to do what we can, given that we are in this very market-based system. So we're trying to sort of make the tweaks that we can to, to generate housing and to generate funding for housing. Um, uh, but that's, it's the idea of city-owned hubs is in, is a pretty interesting one. Um, We'll think about that, particularly as as we're talking about the general plan update and land use over the next several decades, um, and talking about how do we focus on individual neighborhoods and and what they should contain. Um, so thank you. Um, shall we go to Tiffany? Yeah, I have a hi, Joanna. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Um, I have a couple of unrelated questions, and I can write longer comments in an email. Um, 
uh, like the good old days. But uh, I had a question from your original side talking about the goals of the plan because just putting my old Oakland hat on, like the 980 connector has gone like in multiple di directions. Like it wasn't there, then it was an appendix, then it was like it came popped back up with the Howard Terminal. But I guess I felt like I was surprised to see that as being like a goal of the plan. Um, so I was wondering if like something happened or was it just that Caltrans came in with a lot of money? Um, so I, I guess that was that was one question. Um, and then the other one, I guess, on the old Oakland theme is the I think you mentioned something about more industrial between 980 and the water instead of if there was a Howard terminal. Is that it? Could you just say a little bit more about that? Those just seem like both seem like two big changes for old Oakland than than was previously the yeah. previous renditions. So I guess I'll stop with that comment. Yeah. So um, I can say more about those. So the you're talking about the re-envisioning 980. So actually it wasn't changed because Caltrans came in. It was actually the other way around. Um, we already had it in the plan and we're treating it as a goal. Um, and Caltrans took a look at the downtown specific plan and used that as part of their um, grant request to, to look into this. And it's, you know, there. I think what we did was we pulled back on the idea of recommending anything specific um, and so what we have in the plan is there's like a conceptual image of um, if it were to be replaced with a with a boulevard, but the idea is that we're not actually recommending anything in particular, just that we're recommending that West Oakland be reconnected with downtown and that it be done really thoughtfully and with the partnership of the West Oakland community, um, making sure that we don't actually cause more problems by taking out 980. And obviously we would wanna involve the old Oakland community as well, everybody that's on the other side of that. Um, but uh, Caltrans is moving forward with their grant, which is not looking at any particular outcome. They're sort of looking at the whole range of outcomes. Um, so that's what's happening with, with 980. Um, and the area between um, 980 and the water sort of around Howard Terminal. Um, I apologize if I misspoke and said industrial. That area is already very port oriented, but the idea is more that it's a tra transition. So we wouldn't be allowing industrial uses there, but we would be allowing light industrial uses. So rather and not allowing housing next to it. Um, unless some plan moves forward in the future with a major redevelopment of Howard Terminal, at which time they would do an entire study of that whole area. Um, for now, we're recommending that it not be converted to housing and instead we're leaving that as sort of a light industrial buffer. So like businesses, um, non-polluting kind of industrial maker uses, um, pet boarding, you know, the kinds of things that are not like super active um, uh, pedestrian uses uh, and housing uses so they don't conflict with what's happening at the port, um, uh, but not like heavy industrial. It's more of a transition to the West Oakland industrial area. Does that answer those questions, Tiffany? Yes, I, it does. I, I, I would just say that's also, it's in the it's south of the freeway. So it's not, it's more the Jack London area as opposed, I think I heard you say old Oakland. So it's not, it's Yeah, I think she said between, she she got the 980 in the water. Okay, um, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Great, um, first just a comment because we're having a continuing problem. I did not get this morning's email. I don't know what's going on with your automated mail server, but none of your automated mails, I signed up for all the lists again. And I'm just, you know, if you send me an email personally, I get it, but yeah. you're, Sign up list for some reason are blocking our domain or something, and I'm just not getting this stuff. So, can, can you, you talk to your? Did you get the email that we sent um, a couple of weeks ago when we announced this meeting? No, and okay. I wrote to somebody about that too. And first, I was told I'm on the list. We don't understand why. And then I was told, well, actually, uh, we're told that. You've been unsubscribed to all the lists. And then if I had forwarded an email to somebody else and they clicked on unsubscribe, it would unsubscribe me, which sounds like really bad programming. Um, I've talked to our IT person and they said, if it's not coming through and I clearly don't have a spam filter for it, there's a problem on your server's end. Could, 
can you please have somebody look into this? Because I can't call you up and say I didn't get a notice if I don't know that the notice was. You didn't get the notice. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, thank and you. And I can. Did you get that email? Do you need me to forward it to you? Somebody sent me. Okay. Um, uh, today's I didn't, but um, yeah. If you want to forward me, great. You posted the links to the new map, so I bookmarked those. But it'd be great to get the email. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. We'll okay. try and track down whoever we can track down in our IT. And see what the heck is going on because I remember this was an issue a while ago. This too. has happened before too, so yeah. I don't know what's going on. It's odd. Okay, I have sort of scattered comments and questions. Um, I'm still sort of working through all the language and detail as well as trying to go back to some of our comments from four years ago and see what got incorporated and what didn't. So obviously we'll be submitting written comments, but um, I want to start actually with something that's only partially. Uh, um, housing question, which is you're now highlighting Victory Court, I guess as one of your major developments. It is located in the highest risk inundation area in downtown where the least amount of projected sea level rise will, you know, four feet will, will completely inundate that area. Um, why are we choosing such an environmentally at risk area mm -hmm. to concentrate a lot of housing? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. You know, other places are now starting to talk about strategies like retreat, not mitigation and not, you know, um, it it just seems wrong. You know, if this is a long term plan, long term, what's that area going to look like? Yeah, I mean, I will I will say that we would be requiring a, a PUD for that. I can't remember whether that was in the original draft, but the idea is that, you know, any development that happened in that area would be done in a, with like a huge amount of infrastructure. So it's true that if it makes more sense to be developing elsewhere, as we're doing the general plan update, we're obviously going to be looking even further at um, what are opportunity areas throughout the city. Um, but um, just know that we would not be allowing development here without some very intensive sea level rise. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I would really think about it, you know, not just, gee, we'll be, build a big sea wall and hopefully that'll keep the water out or, you know, it'll be Venice and people will have to take canal boats to get there. But it's also going to cause the groundwater table to rise. And so you're just going to have a, a whole bunch of problems happening at the same time. I mean, all we need to do is look at what's happening in Miami. To, to really think about what could happen in some of our lowest line at risk areas. It just doesn't seem like good long range planning. Um, I'll talk a little on the interplay between the zip and the density bonus. This has sort of moved around so much. Um, you know, when we started this process years ago, the talk was of implementing additional housing requirements in the downtown above and beyond what might be required uh, citywide. We talked about additional programs on top of the density bonus. And now that's been completely flipped around so that the zip comes first and then the density bonus. Um, but one of the things I'd like us to think through is if somebody comes in and uses the zip, you know, we had these conversations that the the direct benefits in the form of additional housing units in the ZIP is pretty minimal. Um, it's a very small number of units for a very large increase in density. And the counter argument was, yes, but they'll have to pay the impact fee. And that's where a lot of the land value capture takes place. Um, but if somebody uses density bonus on top of the ZIP, then they're going to provide on-site units pretty much at 80%, maybe at 50%, of median income and get out of having to pay the impact fee on you know the base unit that depend you know if the base for the density bonus is the zip amount of housing so let's say they could have built 50 units and under zip they can do 100 and now they come in for a density bonus they'll provide let's say 10 20% of that 100 as affordable units to qualify for the density bonus, and they will have then produced enough marginally affordable housing to not pay any impact fee at all. I mean, it's not really any different. You know, if it's the base zoning, it's the base zoning. It's what we're seeing now with projects that come in for density bonus and go, look, I got a density bonus and I'm providing affordable housing units, so I don't have to pay the impact fee. 
So, you know, if the biggest actually, Jeff, you know, you'll see the zoning on Friday. And I know we've talked about this before. And actually, Linda did a whole presentation on this. Um, but what we're saying is they still have to pay the impact fees for the base units and for, and the, that for the zip program. So yeah. the base, you know, so let's take this in tiers. Right now, the zoning is 50. Let's say you could build 50 units on that site. I just want to use some easy numbers. They opt to do the zip and they get to do 100 units. And they may have to do, you know, I don't know, three, four additional affordable housing units for those extra 50. They really don't have to do very much. Um, Jeff, but they have to pay the impact fee. We're, um, we're Jeff, we're getting into the zoning. So the zoning, we might want to wait till we hear, see the zoning okay. release <laughs> because we're actually not allowing them now in the zoning to do to for the ha per the conversations we've had and the input we've had we're actually saying if you're going to for affordable housing you actually pay the um the fee for the zoning incentive program instead of building it on site because of the reason that we're not actually getting very many units to your point um, and then if on top of that, they build, they do the density bonus, they still have to pay the zip fee as well as all the impact fees on the base units. And then they can get a density bonus of extra density and other concessions to get the additional units um, with a density bonus. But um, And then they don't have to pay the impact fees on those additional units they get as the density, but they still have to pay the impact fees on the base units. Okay, I'll I'll wait to see the zoning things then and dig into okay. it. We can talk about it in a few weeks when we have that session. I don't want to tie us up now. Um, I have a question on a housing zone. On page 102, it says that the housing goal is 29,100 units. And then on page 113, where you're talking about measures of success, it talks about 42,799 units. Let me pull that up. Um, sorry, will you say those page numbers again? Sure. Uh, page 102. Is that right? Do I have the right one? That doesn't sound right now. Um, he's in a, I'm sorry, 103. Page 103. And then yeah, where? Right? That whole sidebar on affordable housing targets. The first sentence says, you know, we're going to do 15 to 25% of the projected 29,100 total new units. And then where was the other one that you said? And then the 40? other one is on page 112, I think. Yeah, 113, measures of success. And under total housing stock, it says measure of success, downtown Oakland more than triples its current housing stock, 42,799 new units are added by 2040. What is the goal of this plan? My understanding 29, of the 29,000 or 42,000? Yeah, I am, I'm trying to pull it up now um, to see where that number might have come from because it's definitely the 29,000 and we've sort of repeated that everywhere throughout the plan. Um, and that's the number that we had in the public review draft plan too, that we made sure we kept to. Um, so uh, my computer is having trouble opening it right now, but I will make sure that we take a look at that and get back to you on. Great. Yeah, that was page 113. And yeah. So it's under measures of success, total housing stock. Okay and show it to you if you like. Would you like to see it? Sure. I mean, it sounds like it may be in for a typo, unfortunately, so. Yeah. See that? That's right. Um, in right. that first paragraph. Yep. Yes. Um, we will, that could be a typo. It might be... Um, Hmm. Yeah, we'll look into that and figure out what's going on there. Yeah, it's just, it was confusing. Yeah, well, thanks for catching that. So. It's including the Lake Marion area plan, so that, I don't know. That might be, that, that could be it. 
Oh, sorry. Does it say that? Is downtown Oakland more than two say that. housing stock by 2040? 42,799. Yeah. Oh, there we go. That's what happened. That's that's so what a, it is. So We're talking about the entire downtown. Happen in both plan areas. Yeah, so it's not okay. the downtown specific. Okay. okay. Thank you, Naomi, um, for sharing that. You know, we we raised this question before. I think we still have um, concerns about this. If this goal of fifteen to twenty five percent affordable is is much too low, it is first of all well below the city's RENA. So you know, if the best we can do in the part of town that is getting the most intensive residential development, and, you know, a disproportionate share of housing is being built in the downtown. If we're going to end up doing much less than the arena in downtown, we're not even trying to get to our arena goals for, um, you know, we're supposed to be doing 30 or 40 percent affordable overall. 15 or 25 won't do it. And I, I'm trying to find the numbers, but it seems to me that we started off certainly in 2015 with probably 25 percent of the housing downtown being um, affordable. It may be less now because so much more market rate housing has um, been built or is under construction than uh, affordable. If the best we can do is 15 to 25 percent going forward, where we're going to end up at the end is with a lower percentage of lower income housing in the downtown than we started with. That's not going to result in an equitable outcome. It's going to increase segregation. It's going to increase the disparities. It's counter to the housing element goal of closing the gap between market rate and affordable housing production. You know, our general comment is we need to stop focusing primarily on how do we make it possible to build a whole bunch of market rate housing. It's not like we had a hard time building market rate housing in the last eight years. Like while we've been writing this plan, the city produced far more market rate housing than the housing element said it needed to do while falling short on affordable. We'd like to see a plan that says we're going to concentrate on dealing with that gap, not continuing to do what we have been doing all along, because we're going to get the same results and we're not going to be any better off, you know, in 2040 than we are now, because we won't really have have tried to do it. I understand there are resource problems, you know, and all of that. But if we're not even stating as a goal that we're trying to do it, then we'll probably never get there. So we really hope you guys will think about this um, a little more. Um, as I said, I'm going to skip around a bunch. You've called out the um, some actions that you say are consistent with the PATH program, which is you know primarily the city's plan around homelessness. I did not see a similar reference to HCD's strategic action plan. Um, I think it would be really good. Uh, that was just adopted by the council last year. Um, it really shifts the focus of the city's affordable housing to focus primarily on homeless, on extremely low income, and on supportive housing, um, which is really important because it affects, for example, the whole discussion about how do we get to our housing goals? Do we do it by raising more money or by doing inclusionary or density bonus units? Because those kind of units just never get down to that that level of affordability. Um, so, you know, I, I would hope that the, you know, plans that and priorities that council has adopted for HCD get, get reflected here. Um, another thing we talked about four years ago in our comments was that a great deal of the actions called out the strategies in the housing section are about study, consider, evaluate. Um, you know, we mentioned at the time that that's not really a plan. This issue came up around the housing element. Uh, the state called the city out for not having more concrete statements. We still have a preponderance of those kind of statements. It's so like, you know, eight years has gone by and we're still talking about what we will consider and evaluate and, you know, whatever, instead of saying, we're gonna do this. And that's not the way you have addressed things in the other sections where it says, you know, implement this, develop that, you know, whatever. Um, we'd like to see something that's much more definitive in action. You know, the council will have to consider and decide if they're going to do it or not. But a plan, after, you know, after eight years to have a plan that says our plan is to do more planning. You know, I hope, I just hope we can do better than that. Um, so 
Um, let me leave it at that. That's, you know, what I'm seeing so far. And I'm sure, you know, comments we have will get more specific, but there were some really general things that jumped out at us. Okay. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you very much. Yeah, James. Uh, I wanted to raise some uh, questions about uh, how is parking treated in the plan? That's a good question. Um, I think it's treated in a number of different ways. Um, we, I mean, it's definitely consistent with the um, overall approach that we're not building more parking garages, um, but it's it's consistent with the approach that DOT is taking where they're expanding their, I think it's called the Oak Park program um, to much better manage the curbsides that we do have um, and including um, the pricing for the parking and the um, uh, use of more spaces for pickup and, and drop off and ADA parking. Um, what, can you be more specific in your, well, your question yeah. about parking? Well, the plan does talk about uh, wanting to uh, activate the downtown so that more people come downtown and uh, take advantage of the uh, commercial offerings and uh, I guess the housing offerings as well as cultural office, office offerings and so forth. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but in point of fact, the, if we look at the, uh, the city now and 10 years ago and what it'll look like 20 years ago, if we stay on the present path, it's going to be very hard to come to downtown by car. Maybe that's a if if one if this plan uh, had a section that said number of parking spaces that were available in the downtown in 2010, and the number of parking spaces that are, are available in 2025 or 2030, uh, it seems to me that. That would be about a eighty percent drop, at least, uh, of of parking places, and so I don't know how many how the people are gonna get to downtown, or what will how what will bring them there, and and how will disabled people get to downtown and get around? Uh, this uh, there is a policy, this uh, uh, obvious policy of re reducing the number of uh, spaces for cars. And I don't think that's stated in the plan, but that is in effect what has happened and what is happening. Uh, but what will be the effect of this massive reduction of parking? Uh, so I, and the plan doesn't speak to that. And, and also just in terms of mobility, I don't know how far the plan should go in in uh, projecting uh, what should improvements that should be made in the in the bus system, but uh, there are some things that have been done with the buses that really need to be looked at, like removing the bus that used to go down 20th Street and and putting it over to Grand Avenue. That leaves a large part of the city that's not served by uh, bus service, uh, makes uh, convenient to buses. Uh, and and connected to that, there is no bus that goes into the uh, the Gold Coast area at all. Um, so the, the east-west uh, bus connections are, are, are very, I mean, what is there now is not too good and, and it means that people have to do a lot of walking to get for, uh, to buses. So, so I, I yeah, whether or not uh, a policy of reinstating uh, bus transfers so that people can get to different places without having to pay fares each time and have to take different three or four different buses to get to a place. Uh, I don't know if that's part of this plan or whether it should be. And I just had a question whether the mobility chapter and connectivity are those are those part of the same chapter or are they different? Uh, they they connect in so many ways, but 
anyway, that uh, there's there's a whole lot of questions about parking, mobility, and connectivity, and, and that that I don't think are adequately addressed in the plan. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, connectivity and mobility are are the same chapter uh, in the plan. Um, Jeff, are you wanting to? Say yeah, something? just on, on that topic, does the city? comment when AC Transit proposes route changes and changes in service. Um, I mean, I think this would be a really good action to put into um, the plan is that, you know, the city's transportation department or somebody will monitor AC Transit, BART and other transit services for changes in services that might affect issues of access and connectivity in the downtown. Like the city itself should be advocating for this. They don't listen very much when a handful of people show up at those hearings. Um, hopefully they will listen a bit more when the city of Oakland speaks. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do know that we aren't necessarily always in contact with them, that we do meet with them occasionally, but the Department of Transportation staff is in much more frequent contact with AC Transit. Um, I don't know exactly what the procedures are around review of, of changes to bus routes, obviously, they're involved when there are changes that involve infrastructure changes for sure. Um, but it's a good point. That's, re that's reacting to AC transit decisions or coordinating with AC transit around projects. I'm talking about something else, which is actually advocating for the levels of service that people need. Yeah, well, we, we have done some amount of that in the downtown specific plan earlier on in the process, um, but we'll be doing, as Laura just said, a, a lot more of that. Um, as we're updating the land use and transportation element, since obviously that's a that's a citywide, it's a regional issue. Um, so we will be we'll be having a, a technical advisory group that will involve AC Transit, and we'll be having sort of separate meetings on that because absolutely, in the downtown and citywide, um, we can't meet the goals that we want to for density and for access to jobs and schools and shopping and everything if we don't have the public transit to get us there and we can't meet our environmental goals if we're making people rely on their cars yeah i have just two uh, minor questions to add to what i was saying one is uh the uh is brooklyn basin uh tied in to the downtown plan at all or that's totally different no it's outside the area okay all right and the other was i saw one of the one of the illustrations seemed to show, and there was even some uh, narrative about uh, developing on the Laney's parking lot. And if, if in fact, Laney's parking lot is, is developed, is, is, is rezoned for development, where will all those cars go? Is that being thought about at all? Anyway, I just want to throw those out as questions. I don't want to hold up Bill. Sure. I, I'll just very quickly say, um, Laney College, anything that they did there on their property would need to be directly for educational uses. We've heard that very clearly. Um, we just tried to allow flexibility for them in case they want to do some development that would benefit the community and benefit their students. And presumably they would take parking into, um, uh, they would factor that into their decisions as well. But let me go. I'm not sure if Bill or Naomi had their hand up first. I'll defer to Naomi. I think she had her hand up physically first. And Digitally, I got it. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Naomi. Oh, all right. I was just going to second what James said and add that I don't have faith in the Department of Transportation looking sufficiently at two categories of people those who have somewhat impaired mobility, like they might be old like me, and people who live a little further away from downtown. Mm -hmm. So if I'm in West Oakland, I'm not necessarily gonna be able to bike to downtown. If I'm in East Oakland, I'm not gonna bike to downtown. If I'm up on the hill, I can bike down to downtown, but I can't get back up. I think that the bicycle lobby is wonderful and they should not be running the discussion because it does not represent a majority of the people that we are trying to get to come downtown. And so I don't know what to do about that. I love the bike people, it's all good. But I also see that, you know, our roads are too dangerous and the distances are too long. It's unrealistic. 
And if the city has to throw money into AC Transit or encourage them in some other way, they should. And certainly Brooklyn Basin shouldn't be ignored. Again, it's an issue of that east-west connectivity. It may not be in your planning area, but if they're gonna be all those residents there and they have no stores and they have no nothing, no services over there, then they should be coming to downtown. But how are they gonna get there? They go to Alameda. Okay, thank you, Naomi. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, no, just um, and, and good comment. Uh, pick up from what Naomi was saying. You know, it's sort of um, Kevin Lynch's old admonition. But, not Bill, to can you? Yeah. You're you're a little bit garbled, so can you speak slowly? Okay. Um, all right. I'm just going to make one quick quick point from the thread of the conversation I've been hearing. I do agree that we need to, in moving forward, this is not just about the moment of the plan's adoption. This is about how the plan is actually going to be implemented and carried forward over its years. One of the things we definitely need to do, I'm picking up, and I felt this way since I moved out, quite honestly, is that there needs to be a greater convening across the public agencies that do provide services. Because just to your point, Naomi, that on the map, there's not a distinction in time and space from Brooklyn Basin with downtown. I mean, the connectivity is there. They're existing in space and time. The fact of the matter is that for the point you were raising a moment ago around mobility, and uh, it's not just a multimodal conversation, it's also an intermodal conversation. You've got to think about the different modes that might get me from point A to point B. I'm a very, very heavy user of public transit and typically am in the city I'm in because there's a perspective you gain about your city by riding the buses and the subways and the street cars that you're not going to get when you're just in your own vehicle from point A to point B. Um, we, we, one of the outcomes of, of this exercise really needs to be having a forum. I think this is what uh, Joanna was alluding to also, that there will be an ongoing uh, consortium committee, et cetera, in moving the plan for implementation where these other agencies have to be at the table. And again, in most other cities I work in, there was never a question about that. That they, the housing authority, the transit authority, um, infrastructure, whether they were, were departments that were vetted in city hall or separately state chartered uh, agencies, that if they're working within the jurisdiction of the city, there's got to be regular coordination and convening. And, and again, I, I just I, I want to make sure that we don't get too um, hung up or ossified around the idea that. This is a one time bite. Once we do this plan, it's on the shelf and it's done. This is really a point of departure. I think the thing is to make sure that we've got the factors aligned and the strategy down. And all the points you'll have been making about having the goals clearly articulated, absolutely right. But this is going to take constant, constant attention and engagement. And even around some of the numerical goals that you were citing, within two or three years' time, those are going to change as well. I mean, there's just no way that this plan is going to stay on its trajectory, even with what it's projecting at this moment. But we had an extreme example of that with the pandemic coming right in the midstream of all this work. So I guess I'm advocating for as much of a structure and an ongoing framework for the plan's implementation as I am in getting to some closure around its adoption. Uh, and, and that's it. Um, but, but the comments have been great. Really have, have, um, I'm glad to have been here this night to hear them. And I'm going to go back with my um, mode where no one can hear me. Okay, thanks, Bill. Um, I think it was Chris and then Jeff. Okay, thank you. Um, got two uh, sets of follow-up questions. I'll just do the first one and so that Jeff can then weigh in. Um, I'm surprised that uh, we have such low attendance at today's meeting. I'm wondering if staff has any idea why that's the case. And could we also have a list of all the CAG members because that may have changed since the last time and that, that helps us keep track of uh, you know who uh, has been invited to these meetings? Um, I don't believe the list has changed since the last time we sent it to you, but we can send it again. Thank you. So any idea why there minimal attendance? Did you get enough, any nibbles from other uh, CAG folks? 
We didn't really hear anything and we sent a follow-up reminder today, though we're also hearing Jeff didn't receive his email. Um, we'll try and get to the bottom of that and if we do see if that's impacting anyone else as well. Um, but no, we haven't, have not really heard anything. If you hear from anybody about why they might not be attending, if they've just lost interest after many, many, many years of the project or what, um, please let us know. Um, and maybe, maybe it would be good following up on Jeff's um, comment to send emails to CAG members individually rather than use the group emailing. Yeah, just to confirm that. that they've received the group emails. Yeah, maybe we'll do that and we'll send out the follow-up from this email um, along with the presentation link. We can send it directly to that list. And so I have another a point that I'll, I'll lower my hand so that Jeff can uh, say and come in next. Thanks, okay. Chris. Um, just two quick things. One, um, I wanted to come back on the housing goals, given that we've got some numeric goals for affordable housing upwards of, you know, on the high end 7,500 units. It would be really useful to include then an estimate of the amount of local subsidy that would be necessary to produce those units and an identification of what resources we know we already have and to at least start thinking, I mean, we've still got, what, $200, $250 million of funds left from Measure U, even though some of it's been allocated. If the regional bond passes, the city's going to get between $380 and $750 million in bond funds allocated directly to it. That actually is enough to do 7,500 units or get really close. And, you know, that's not including you know, revenue from impact fees uh, or anything else that's coming in, let's get a snapshot of what it would take to achieve our goals and identify if there's a gap and then start thinking about strategies to fill the funding gap rather than just throwing up our hands and saying, well, we're never going to get to all, all this housing because it costs a lot of money and we don't have it. I, I think we can do better than that. So, um, I'm sure the folks at HCD can help you with that, both in terms of looking at the average subsidy that they are putting in per unit and what funding sources they have and, and can reasonably project. Um, you know, and frankly, I will say showing how much of a difference a regional housing bond would make to meeting our housing goals would do a lot to build support for actually getting that thing passed so that we actually have the resources we need to address some of these problems. A second That's comment I had um, comes back to the issue of implementation, and I would really like to see um, a real commitment to providing annual reports on accomplishments. Um, we would really like to know how much, for example, how much affordable housing has been produced in the different specific plan areas in Oakland since those plans were adopted. We asked. And what we were told was, you're not tracking it. We were welcome to go back through each year's housing element, identify all the projects that had been issued building permits and figure out for ourselves which ones were in which uh, uh, you know, specific plan areas. But we would really like to be tracking how many total units and how many affordable units are getting you know, entitled and permitted and completed. You're collecting that data already for the housing element. The only thing you don't have right now is which specific plan area they are in. It shouldn't be that difficult. And it would be immensely useful in assessing whether our specific plans are actually doing what they were intended to do. And I assume you'd want similar goals for how much office space are we building and how many jobs are being created and, you know, a bunch of other stuff. But if we don't have those metrics and we don't report them out, we can't really have a good sense of whether the plan is working or not. Yeah, I mean, that's that's why we included the metrics in each chapter so that we would um, be tracking those. And we know that in some cases, there are things that we are not yet tracking that we need to yeah. start tracking. Well, yeah, and my comment, there are a lot of metrics, they're really good, but there's nothing that says we will collect this data and report on it annually. It just says if we wanted to know if we were closing the gap on affordability, we would be looking at these indicators. So I'd like to see something that actually says we're going to do this. Got it. Yeah. 
think that's that's part of the intent of the the housing chapter, but I hear the need to I be think clear that should, about that. Yeah, I mean, I would say in the implementation chapter, there should be a clear commitment to producing those kind of annual reports. I think that's, I think we need to track the data. I think that's absolutely right. We need to make a determination based on the systems we have in place. And you used to work there, Jeff, as well. Uh, we need to get, because I, I agree with you in principle, between a, a good tracking system for permits and a GIS system, you really shouldn't have a hard a problem doing this as a place-based data capture, I get it. But um, I, I would like for us to take a look at this before we say it will be annual. But I certainly think on a, at, at a biannual basis, we certainly should be able to. Thanks, Bill. Um, uh, yes, Chris. Thank you. Um, actually, I now have two points. First, uh, responding to you know Jeff's you know comments about you know resources to develop affordable housing, at least public resources. I'm wondering if it'd be worth you know, until redevelopment was abolished. Redevelopment funds, I believe, are the, one of the main sources, perhaps the most important source for developing affordable housing. And the elimination of redevelopment seems to have pulled the rug out from under the ability to develop affordable housing you know, publicly. So I'm wondering if it would be worthwhile as an action step to get the city of Oakland to cooperate with other local government agencies to urge the state to bring back redevelopment in at least some form to help address the need for affordable housing. And uh, staff or Jeff, do you have any thoughts on that before I bring up my second point? Bill, I think you need to speak slower. Okay. Again. I, thought, I thought Jeff was about to say something. Um, yeah, just sort of quickly, I, I, I don't disagree with you, Chris, and, and I think one can just look uh, on the timeline and feel there's a correlation. Uh, but I just also a, a policy position. We'd have to really get vetted and at the CAO and the mayor's uh, office level. I think that's just a call for us to make. Um, and I'd be happy to raise the issue. Because it, it, it does seem to me that at least it's worth having a study to, car, to make sure there's clear correlation between um, the having disbanded the, the redevelopment authorities and what we've seen as a spike up in the um, homelessness in this state. Uh, and it'd be good to have that with some data. Again, I, I, I observationally, heuristically, I get it. I mean, I, it seems that that has struck me as probably a cause and effect relationship. But I think having a, a good set of numbers that would back that up before advancing the conversation would probably be something you would want to look at. And how that's done, such across multiple cities and jurisdictions, I think you want to have some uh, broad sampling of that so that you don't get the sort of statistical argument, well, that's only a problem because the city has its other issues. We want to have a broad enough sampling so that we can really make some correlation there between the um, uh, demolition of the redevelopment authorities, their, their, their abolition, and um, the, the spike we saw we've seen in homelessness. Um, I'll, I'll also add that we have the um, there is the enhanced infrastructure financing district option, which is sort of similar in the tax increment financing, but different, obviously, from redevelopment. Um, and that is something that you know we're exploring. Uh, but go ahead, Jeff, you were going to say something. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to minimize the impact of the loss of redevelopment, though I think in the intervening years, we've started to find um, replacement sources like the impact fee, for example. Um, you know, redevelopment at its peak was giving us about $30 million a year for affordable housing. So, you know, we've passed a couple of major housing bonds that have generated far more money than that. I think the issues around the increase in homelessness are um, probably a lot deeper than just we've lost redevelopment. Um, it's not even clear to what extent redevelopment was really getting at the worst case needs because the kind of financial support that any of these programs can provide is limited in its ability to reach people at the lowest income without some kind of 
um, rental or operating subsidies as well. You know, HCD has talked about this repeatedly. I think they've done a great job of partnering with the housing authority on getting as much project-based Section 8. Uh, it's why they're able to require that 20% of the units in their projects be at extremely low income. And I think they've actually exceeded that goal. Um, so we have a serious problem around homelessness. And um, I think it just runs a lot deeper than just, gee, we lost redevelopment. And I would love for us to have redevelopment back for a bunch of reasons. I'm not sure it, it would be the magic bullet we all hope. I will also say that as interested as we are in exploring an EIFD, I think we also need to understand that it takes a long time once you establish a tax increment area to build up any significant increment. Um, it, and especially when with an EIFD, we are mostly going to get only the city's 29% share of the increment, unlike the 100% share that we got under redevelopment. So it's a nice tool to have in the toolbox. It will never replace redevelopment. Um, doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but we shouldn't really look to it to, to operate on the same scale either. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, Chris or... Bill, were one of you going to respond to what Jeff just said, or? Chris had a hand up before I. Go ahead. Okay. And then yeah, I, I'm just I, noting that it's 7.48, so we're getting close to right. the yeah. I, I was going to sh shift gears. Uh, when I started out describing the S13 versus the ZIP and the relation of the state density bonus law, I'm not sure if, I'm still not sure if I clearly communicated why with unlimited density, you the density bonus law still applies and how you do density bonus. And I guess this, my question is directed mainly at Laura. Laura, did, did I make that, did I communicate that clearly? Are, are we on the same page on how density bonus law works if you have unlimited yeah, density? I, mean, I, gotta, I think I explained, you know, there's different rationale for the different programs. So they're, they're not the same. Well, I think they are, though. You, if I understood you correctly, you indicated the fact that the S13 allows unlimited density, which is not the case with the ZIP. That makes them different and not really comparable. Well, but again, I think what the main difference. I think we've stated this ten times, maybe now. I don't know. <laughs> is that when we worked on the downtown plan? We were looking at increasing density in different areas in, of the city, which is what we've done. And we studied an EIR for that purpose. And so that was the, the density that we wanted actually as a base density, that was the goal. And we did, in what we heard from the community was that in return for that extra density, we wanted to have some community benefits we created a community benefit program for that value capture program. Um, but then because the EIR studied a, a maximum, and this is to Jeff's point earlier, which is why it's programmed this way as opposed to um, having the density bonus first and then the ZIP program on top of it, is because when you study an EIR, you have to study what is, from a CEQA standpoint, what's the maximum density, and a density bonus can go on top of that. You cannot do it the reverse way around because then we would exceed what the EIR actually studied. So that is the way it was. It's it's um, done in this fashion. The way we we've set it up. Yeah, I understand all that you said, and that makes sense. But I'm still, and we can discuss that further, and we'll be submitting written comments, of course. Uh, but I'm still not sure if um, we're on the same page regarding how the density bonus law works if you have unlimited density. And should I restate my understanding of how that works? I'm not sure. I mean, we're, we're talking about the, the zoning incentive program right now. So, and, and also, again, I think today's program was supposed to be really about the plan. And we have another meeting yet about the the zoning that will be coming up. And so you're getting into a lot of the details about the zoning, but, and I think we're, we're kind of running low on time here. So I think I see Jeff has his hand up and then Tiffany does as well. well I just want to make sure, are you, did, was I, that communicate clearly how the density bonus law works with unlimited density? I think it's good to bring this up now so we don't get 
you know, so we have a, it helps us start the discussion on the zoning if we're to make sure we're on the same page on this question. I mean, I, again, I think if we can concentrate on what we're talking about right now, which is the zoning, well, again, I think we would rather get into this in the next meeting, Chris. Well, and we can't. I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to discuss it any further right now. I, I think I've answered your question, um, and you know we can we can discuss it more at the next meeting. Okay. And well, he's going to have a lot of stuff to discuss. Uh, we might, but okay. Uh, we're getting near the end. I will uh, lower my hand. And I'd yes. like to actually offer it a suggestion along those lines. We're not going to get into a discussion of that, especially now that it's almost eight o'clock. Um, but it would be very useful for the zoning discussion that we know that one of the questions is, if we have a program that provides unlimited density within a particular building envelope, how does one apply density or could one apply density bonus in a situation like that? But I will also caution, you know, from what I'm hearing, at least anecdotally, a large amount of the use of the density bonus isn't about the additional units. Mm -hmm. It's about the incentives. We get people coming in applying all the time for density bonus and they don't do a single additional unit, but they get all kinds of additional concessions on height and setback and whatever that from the developer standpoint is actually more valuable than the additional units. I think it would be really useful for us to have a report on how density bonus has been used you know, at a minimum in the downtown, if we're going to be looking at it, its usefulness to the downtown plan, how what percentage of the projects built in downtown, let's say in the eight years that we've been working on this plan, um, have used density bonus, to what extent did they get additional units as opposed to um, incentives? Which of the several options did they use in terms of uh, affordability? Did they do very low income or low income? Um, and to what extent did they do that in order to uh, essentially achieve the alternate alternate compliance with the uh, impact fee so that what we got was some on-site units, but then they didn't pay the impact fee. We know all of that's going on, but we don't have a good measure of it, you know, and so it would be really helpful to to understand how often the density bonus is used and in what ways it's being used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it might be hard for us to be able to provide information on when they used it just to get out of the impact fees, but um, but I don't, mean the that other they used it, I don't mean that they used it. You don't know that they did it just to do that, right. but we do know that that was the consequence in many cases. And so, you know, we can just note, okay, they took a density bonus and they did 10% uh, lower income in order to get their density bonus, and therefore they were exempt from the impact fee. Right. You don't have to speak to their motivation. It's more about what the outcome was. Yeah, um, and and I know we had provided you with some information about the about what buildings have been used or have, what projects have used state density bonus, but um, but I do think it does make sense to track it as best we can to see what the impacts are. Great, thanks. Go ahead, Tiffany. Oh, I just had a broad question, maybe a good one to end on. Um, and I maybe I came in a little late, but um, could you speak a little bit about how you, your team's been keeping everyone informed in terms of like public leadership or the commissions? It feels like there's been so much turnover amongst all of this and no, not many people are actually talking about the vision of this plan, like anyone owns it. <laughs> so I guess, or or even knows about it. So I just I just kind of wondering if in terms of just broader, like how have you been trying to um keep sure. leadership informed in terms of taking ownership? Because a lot of what's in the plan is like the community ownership or community involvement. But I just I just would love to see some some awareness of this um publicly from the from the leadership. So I'm wondering yeah. how that's been the last couple of years from your side. Yeah. So we, I mean, we have been working with the leaders. Obviously, we had a couple different transitions, um, but you know, um, Council Member McElhaney was very supportive of the project, and Carol, Council Member Fife has been 
as well, we've had a number of conversations. We did early on briefings with her and have had multiple conversations. Um, uh, and um, obviously, uh, Mayor Tao, when she came on board, we gave her a briefing on this and she's been very supportive of this because it's very sort of complimentary to all of the um, short term work that her office and and the um, economic and workforce development office have been doing to try and support downtown and, you know, things like the $5 after five parking and increased security ambassadors and just sort of the more short term interventions. Um, so she's been supportive of this as a in her office have been supportive of this as a long term one. So in fact, we did a joint um, press briefing on it before the, the plan was released. Um, so we are trying to get information out into the community about it. We're also using our social media and we're also going to be doing, we're starting our briefings with um, planning commissioners next week because there's been a lot of turnover there as well. Um, so we'll be briefing all the planning commissioners and we'll be briefing all the CED members as well. Um, Bill, do you want to add on to that? Bill, you've got your hand up, but you're um, muted if you are trying to speak. Hey. There we some, go. I did not be on my mic and not want to liberate. Um, no, I just was going to say that uh, you mentioned the mayor's uh, office, uh, Mayor Tao, that her chief of staff has also been very engaged and um, the conversations around the uh, uh, downtown specific plan. In fact, we were out walking uh, some of the corridors earlier this week and uh, we had some, and she has a very strong urban design orientation also from uh, work she's done in other cities. So I uh, just to echo what John was saying, I think they had come in and seen this as a principal tool in helping to um, get the city in its recovery terms, obviously post COVID, but also through the value uh, proposition that you all have been talking about this plan on before I left, around culture and entertainment and diversity and housing. And also uh, being a showcase for people all open, so it's not just a downtown, but it's you know everyone's. There. So um, I think that, that the point though to be made also very important kind of gets back to some of what we said earlier. But we have to make sure upon adoption that this plan still has its champions. You now this cannot be sort of a check a check the box and sort of one and done kind of thing. Another specific plan now off to the next exercise. So um, now I would imagine and hope that. In down this people of the tag, there'll be ongoing interest in stewardship and implementation. And again, things change. I mean, we, we get this adopted, and uh, within two or three years, we'll be wanting to revisit, not to do all of the plans, but we want to make sure that we have engagement and uh, focus and, and goal setting on a regular basis over the life of this plan in order to keep it live and relevant. And that's also going to have a lot to do with how many people take interest in it. They're going to have to believe that it matters. And, we're, and the only way that's going to happen is if you demonstrate. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, as Laura mentioned, we're working on the update to the land use and transportation element um, and other elements as well. Um, that's getting going soon, the phase two of the general plan update. And we're wanting to really bring together a lot of different um, intergovernmental, interregional uh, agencies. Um, and really make sure that we are all working together. So I think, you know, as we're developing the specific plan implementation committee, we're, we're also sort of at the same time going to be trying to create more of that um, partnership uh, outside the city. Um, so I'm hoping that those will too, those will be sort of synergistic. Um, we are now at time. I see James is coming on. Did you have anything you wanted to, to wrap us up with? No, thank you. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Um, and we will see you again for the now rescheduled um, meeting on zoning, which we'll be publishing and sending out tomorrow. And we will forward directly to you, Jeff, and we'll be looking into finding out what happened there. Um, so thank you everybody for your detailed review and very detailed questions um, and like clear attention and, and passion about all of these issues and really improving Oakland. And thank you for all your work. Uh, very good. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you all. Take thank care. you, everyone. Bye. Good night.
Thank you.